What's going on, guys? It's Bromley. I'm back from a couple week hiatus from making videos. I was polishing up uh, peak strength, so I got that up in live on the Empire Barbell Store, EmpireBarbellStore.com. And I'm really happy with the way that book came out. We talked a lot about specialization and the journey from novice to advanced. And there's some implications for how to change your training when uh, you guys start to get stuck. That has to do with how you evolve, how, how experienced you become that isn't really explicitly stated very often. So I wanted to get into that. And that actually has a lot to do with this. This is a deadlift workout I'm about to cover. Uh, and I had to make a lot of tweaks as time went on uh, based on those very things. So I'm going to cover that a little bit right now. So I started out with bent rows. Um, I switched to pen lay rows to, to more of like a, a power row, a little bit of cheat, a little body English in because I wanted some overload to better deadlift uh, specific movement. So I've been pushing the weight on that, try to fix some weaknesses in my upper back. Here I'm, uh, I'm showing you guys the goods, um, getting up close and personal as I put my suit on. This is another element of specialization. I'm competing at OSG later, which allows deadlift suits. So this is a loose metal deadlifter I've had for years and years. I can get it on by myself pretty quick and it's not super tight. Once you get the really advanced ones with the straps, you can crank them down to where you can't even physically get to the bar. You have to pull all kinds of shenanigans to try and get down there in the first place of pressure, breaks all the blood vessels in your face, it's not fun. So this can give a good amount of pop right off the floor, but people generally don't get more than 30 or 40 pounds out of a suit, and that's only if you're weak off the floor and you're strong at lockout, which I'm pretty even throughout. Uh, really, I feel more secure when I pull in this, so it's easier to brace my midsection. I don't know that the bar really leaps off the floor much faster, but uh, it's definitely a psychosomatic uh issue so you see me kind of reaching practicing uh getting extension i have a long back so i gotta let my arms hang as much as possible uh anybody that teaches you to do a deadlift with your shoulders retracted with your shoulder blades back uh doesn't know what the hell they're talking about there's no no good lifters that do that uh you have to build a strong enough upper back and it's pretty easy to do to build a strong enough upper back that can maintain that hang. Um, and the important thing is that you start in that position. You learn to get strong and braced in that position. So you're not um, uh, you're not letting it round as the weight that becomes too heavy pulls you over. You want to find your position and keep it fixed. Learn to brace around that. So you see me kind of wiggle down, getting into the bar, uh, practicing, bracing, set my hips the right position. I'm starting with my hips higher than I used to. And that's something I've been able to do as my back has gotten stronger, as my brace around my midsection has gotten stronger. And I find I can really demonstrate a lot more horsepower into the bar. So my split right now, I'm training deadlift every four days. And I usually warn against high deadlift frequency. So what I'm doing, one, it's temporary. This is kind of a base phase. I'm adapting to a lot of volume and fatigue. I am keeping RPE light. I'm on what I call a static program, meaning I don't have a pre-planned progression. I stay at the same rate of exertion. If I feel stronger one week, I go up in weight. If I don't, I stay the same or go down. Uh, that's all there is to it. And I run that for so many cycles. Uh, I'm on a nine day training week, so I'll run it for you know three or four nine day training weeks and I'll swap the exercises. Eventually I'll go into an actual progression as I prep for the meet that's coming up. Um, but that allows me to kind of meander, to, to see what exercises work, uh, what I can recover from. Uh, I can train a lot of different thresholds. One day, this is a top set of five I'm doing, followed by a back off set. The other day, I'm just doing meandering singles. And they're all supposed to be about an RP7. So I felt pretty good last week at 545 for five. So I took a jump to 585. This is probably the best this weight has felt in, in a couple years. Uh, probably since the last time I pulled a, a 605 for 10. I feel like uh, fresh, see my straps are slipping a little bit. I didn't chalk up my hands, so I had to re-tighten up the straps. Um, but pull away, I could have done, I think, 13 or so uh, at that weight. That felt very, very good. And then I'm throwing in the end to, to um, cause some more local fatigue and really get a burn in my hamstrings and my glutes. I'm doing touch and go on my high rep sets, which I'm not used to doing. And what that does is, the bar leaps a little quicker off the ground because you can use stretch reflex, but it keeps tension on your posterior. There's no break point where you can rest. So your glutes on high rep sets get absolutely torched. So uh, here's me just chipping away. What is this? 515. And uh, this is a pretty easy 10. Um, I don't like to toot my own horn, and but I'm constantly trying to evaluate what my actual capability is because I always keep it sub max. And I feel like, uh, I mean, this was probably a 20 repper if I kept going. I just felt very dialed in. 
Um, working into the suit suits great for reps because you can work into the tension and it can kind of augment that stretch reflex. So for OSG, which is in November, that's what I'm getting down. We have the really heavy deadlift medley that goes from 585 to 725. You got to do it all within a minute. So I'm excited for that. My deadlift's feeling really strong. So now we go to my beautiful wife, Laura, who is drilling her log presses. She has to do the OSG qualifier, which is hitting a top uh, I think it's hitting a top triple from the shoulders. So I'm trying to get her to jerk. She has insanely strong upper body. She's a very strong presser. And you see when she ends up muscling it. So what we're trying to do is get her to dip under the log. And I was trying to get her to kind of split her feet out. And she's very hesitant to do it. Um, so we're practicing dropping under the log. We're practicing uh, pausing. We're practicing uh, holding it so she knows where that bottom position is. And here she's giving me feedback. She's telling me that she knows it wasn't good. She knows she's shorting it. When the weight gets heavy, she feels like the uh, her tendency is to not bend her knees or to move her feet. Her tendency is to stay stable. So she glues herself under it. So she worked up. This is actually a PR for her. I think it was 157, which is the most she's ever pressed on a log. It was 153 or 157. And uh, she did it with that little bit of a pause. And even though it's a little sloppy, she can kind of muscle through it. So now we're going into back off singles and she's talking about, you know, it's a weight throwing her back a little bit. So she has to focus more to brace. So one of the re uh, reasons I like singles and I'm doing it on my other day for deadlifts, she's doing it on this day for uh, upper body. Everything's just around singles is because it gives you an opportunity to practice skill. Sub maximal singles, if you're keeping the RPE under, let's say a nine, let's say eight and lower, allows you to adapt around the weight that you need to build this skill with and now you see each one at this weight this is 137 i think she's just starting to stick it more aggressively it's starting to get where it's supposed to go you can't get that sensation with weights that are lighter than this and if weights are heavier it's going to force you out of position so this is a sweet spot so i really like singles repeating singles so long as it's skill based and not just trying to cause fatigue or to really just beat you down with the weight so here I told her to take it for a double and she just stuck it. And actually the week after this, she hit 162 and it just flew. So though SG weights 175, I have no doubt in my mind she's going to do, you know, three, four reps by the time that comes around. Uh, I really like partial pin presses. Um, we modified a couple ways to keep things fresh, really. It's not that an, in an incline is really targeted. You can use more weight than you can when you are uh, seated or when you're completely upright. Uh, but I just like this as a method of overload. Um, we do our partial movements after the main movement. Um, and it's just, it's great for getting weight in your hands because the more weight you get in your hands, even if it's not the same movement pattern, the more you're going to wake up your nervous system and the lighter other weights are going to feel. And then that's lockout specific. So it gives her that little play in the joints when it comes to padding the jerk, because especially with the log jerks almost never end up exactly where they're supposed to. So it's nice to know that you can come a little bit short from sticking and you still have that margin for air to, to move around in it. So she's been doing fantastically well. I'm really excited to see what she pulls out with this. So I'm in the squat right now. Um, I'm still working around my knees, which are just a little beat up and they've been beat up for a couple of years. Uh, it's something that I'm just, I'm getting to the point where I'm accepting I have to work around it because I've gone through long months where I just didn't do anything and the inflammation would get better. And then I would do a contest prep to get worse. So now I'm trying to find a middle ground where I can rehab as I get stronger, because I think although the inflammation dropped out, if I don't do anything, then the, the atrophy, I need the tendon strong and I'm only going to get that by squatting. So I'm taking a wider stance than normal knees coming out, keeping the, the knees back more than I usually do. I usually squat very upright and uh, push my knees forward quite a bit. And I can't do that anymore. Uh, given the fact that my patellar tendons are are inflamed from the last injury I sustained with them. So this is a way around. I put on a very light wrap. It's more psychosomatic than anything. And I'm just doing pauses. I'm just practicing control, uh, working hip mobility, seeing if I can sink lower with that wider stance. So it opens my glutes up uh, quite a bit. And it's good for starting power on deads. It's a good just kind of basic uh accessory movement that carries over to a lot of different things so if it can keep my knees healthy while coaxing some recovery in my tendons that's going to be great we'll see if it works out that way so i'm practicing step loading which is just keeping the weight the same 315 doesn't hurt and it moves very fast so i'm going to keep the weight around 315 to 365 probably for the rest of the cycle until i switch the exercises and then i'll evaluate and make a jump but i'm just accruing sets of five practicing on more speed out of the hole practicing being comfortable at, uh, at the bottom 
and hopefully I can derive some growth from this. And because it is low impact, it's pretty, uh, it's very low effort, right? Uh, so hopefully I can derive some benefit from this without sapping energy from my deadlift. It's a very heavy, uh, deadlift heavy split that I'm on right now. Again, pulling twice a week, about every four or five days, uh, two different thresholds, fives on one day, singles on another, everything reduced effort. And then I have squatting exercises that are just kind of rounding that out. And that's been going really well. So uh, the, the weight just, it feels like nothing. And I'm tempted to try to run back up because I know when my squat is up, everything's up. So it's been really, really hard to to hold myself back, but that's what I have to do because I have to be healthy. You know, I can't do yoke runs and loads and, and heavy overhead presses if my knees are just crying every time I dip my knees or every time I take a step. So uh, hopefully this is going to coalesce into something that's sustainable because I got a lot of contests up. I don't, I didn't really announce it, but uh, America's Strongest Man they're taking a note from OSG and from Clash on the Coast, and they opened up their pro divisions, which they should have done years ago, to amateurs through an online qualifier. So they're trying to get more people out. There was a year, I'm not kidding, a couple years ago, ASM for the heavyweights only had three people show up, three heavyweights. So they're realizing that it's cool to have this, this pro competitive field, but it's better. You can only have so many pro contests. And then you insulate the people that make uh, that pro uh status you insulate them from other competition because winning a, a show yeah it's a sign that you're good but there are a lot of really good amateurs that plays very very high at shows like osg that pit pros from one organization against other elite amateurs so you end up insulating people from the competition out there because it takes a lot of competitions to flesh out who's consistently the best so there's only a couple guys every year that get a pro card uh, which isn't a lot. And you want these guys competing against uh, each other on a really wide scale. So I think it's better that they do this. And I think you're going to get a better example of who the best is. So anyways, ASM decided we'll have an online qualifier. Uh, it's a 7 for us, for the middleweight, 725 deadlift for reps, which is heavy. Um, 305 log for reps. It's not that heavy. And then a 325 farmers for speed, which is a pretty good event for me. So I'm going to throw my hat in and see if I can make it to America's Strongest Man in September. Um, they're only taking top three from the online qualifier, so it, it, you are really going to have to be very good to get in. So we'll see. If not, I'll go to Nationals, and we're doing OSG regardless, and then I'm about three weeks out from the show in Texas that we're doing. So I got a busy year, and uh, you see my wife is, she's just she's gotten so jacked over the last couple of years. Um, her upper body grew like a weed. It was the first thing to grow on her. So I really have her do a lot of bodybuilding accessory, and she's taking it seriously. This stuff is vital to keep you well-rounded, and that's what Peak Strength talks about. It talks about how you need more mass. You need to round out weak areas. You can't get by with just dumbbells, and or sorry, with just barbells. Um, and we go into that a lot, but it doesn't work unless you take it seriously, and Laura's been taking it seriously. She worked with one of her bodybuilding friends for a while, and they do a lot of rest pause, a lot of sets to failure and then beyond failure, and she would just be gritting her teeth, screaming, getting after it. So she's... She's put in work. She's gone through the weeds on this, and she's grown from it. And it's definitely carried over on her log. Her log blew up probably 5% just over the last couple months, and I think she's slated for a huge PR. She'll be knocking on a 200-pound log pretty soon, the way things are moving. So I'm excited for that. Um, let's see. I'm getting into Romanian deadlifts. Uh, one of my favorite uh, foundational movements, I talk about this in peak strength. This is like a default novice foundational movement. It's different enough that you can increase the frequency by training it at other times of the week, but it hits a lot of the same muscle groups, the range of motion, the control, the tempo, how hard you have to brace, uh, the stress on your upper back and your lats. This movement is key. I was talking to Ode Haugen at the training hall uh, about one of the most impressive seat, uh, feats I've ever seen was Martin's Lisa's pulling 800 pounds for reps. He pulled for like eight reps or something. And it's so clean and so dialed in and Ode is like, it's all the RDLs he does. He squats heavy, and then he immediately does a bunch of RDLs, super controlled, super light touch at the bottom. And it just gave him all the, this extra mass for sure, but this extra brace ability, this extra control around his deadlifts. And he's one of the best deadlifters out there. I mean, he hangs with Shaw. He hangs with, with Thor in their days when he's peaked out. Um, he, he's fantastic. So I like it uh, for teaching the hinge pattern. Uh, but also developmentally, it builds mass in the right areas. So it's a key deadlift movement. Um, my hip belt squat has been gathering dust. So I decided if I'm going to get my knee straightened out, I'll use that as a tool. It takes stress off the low back, which I like. Um, <clears throat> trying to deadlift a lot 
having the bar on your back in a squat, as much as I love squats, it just, it compounds stress. More work your erectors have to do, more wear that your spine and hips have to take. So having the hip bell squat is nice because I can, you know, keep the weight loaded around my pelvis and I'm really just loading the glutes, quads, and hamstrings. Um, so I'm using that. So I'm doing these supersets. What we were doing in the beginning were just bodybuilding sets. We were just doing uh, rest pause with individual movements. So then we switched and I decided to move the specialization dial forward so that we would do our accessory now heavier in a way that allows more load. So I'm doing these contrast supersets where I have one kind of compound accessory movement that we go heavy on and I'll do six to eight reps and then we immediately go into an isolation exercise. Uh, so for my lower body, I was doing this with good mornings too. I do good mornings for heavy for sets of six to eight and then go into a single leg hamstring curl. And it just, in that singular switch from from the from phase one to phase two, where literally all we did was change the main exercise and then change the accessory, we were all sore. Everybody that's running this template was sore for a couple of days. Uh, and then, you know, the next week you, you adapt to it and things start moving up again, you start getting better. So those changes, and again, I talk about this in peak strength, those changes moving forward are what keep you adapting. They're what, they're what keep you uh, growing. And that's what you want to be mindful of, the directionality of it. We start lighter, we start with higher reps, we start with more variations, time goes on, we get more specialized so things get heavier. And we find these little tricks to kind of tick, uh, tick things up depending on how heavy we're supposed to be. We're still accruing a lot of fatigue right now, so I'm keeping it in a superset. In the future, I might just do single sets to get even heavier in lower rep. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Laura uh, couldn't do RDLs for a long time. She's gotten a lot better at these, and that's carrying over to her deadlift. And this culminated, she mashed these workouts together. I think she missed a day, so she had to do her upper lower body workouts in the same day. And it culminated with this. I was really proud of her here. She hits a nice smooth 355 for a single. Uh, she's got her first 400 deadlift coming this year, and that'll set her up nicely for OSG. So this is, we're excited. It's going to be great. So thanks for watching, guys. Till next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.